This, this evening, we are going to be looking at the Aztecs and their pantheon. Uh, meeting, the uh, talk will be about 40 minutes long, and uh, let's have questions afterwards, as is usual for these public lectures. I will warn you in advance that what we are about to talk about is somewhat gory, for that is the nature of the Aztecs, but the pictures that we're going to look at in the slides are probably at worst 15 rated, so you don't have to worry about disturbing images. I am a telephone engineer, not a historian, so there may be some simplification here, so those who are versed in history, uh, please be merciful. So the Aztecs were the dominant culture in what is today Mexico between the 1430s and their conquest by the Spaniards in 1521. Uh, the founding myth of the Aztecs was that they originated in a mythical place called Aztlan and their tribe was told by their patron god Huitzilopochtli to migrate away from Aztlan which is a place that nobody really knows, nobody actually knows where it is so it's a sort of, it is a, a mythical place and then have to restart the slideshow. There we go. There. So. Okay. Sorry about right. That. So they were told by a shaman who heard from Huitzilopochtli in a dream to leave Aztlan, and they wandered through Mexico, what is today Mexico, for a couple of hundred years until they saw this, an eagle with a snake in its beak standing on a cactus. And they saw that on a rocky island in the middle of a salty lake and decided that this would be an excellent place to settle. So this image is on the flag of Mexico and is seen all over Mexico. It's a, an important image in uh, modern Mexican culture and it comes from the founding myth of the Aztecs. So why is it that the Aztecs decided to um, like pitch up on this rocky island in the middle of a lake? So this lake is Lake uh, Texacoco and it is located where Mexico City is today. And the reason they ended up there was that for a while they settled in a place on the bank on the shore of Lake Texacoco and uh, at the permission of another tribe and they invited a nobleman in this tribe to offer one of his daughters to become a bride of Huitzilopochtli, which you'll remember is their patron god, of whom we will hear more later. And he thought, well, that sounds good, my daughter being the bride of a god. So off she went, and the Aztecs treated her like a goddess for a while, not very long, which is the way that the Aztecs did things, and then ritually sacrificed her, and then flayed off her skin, and um, when Daddy came along to see how his daughter was doing in her elevated role as the bride of Huitzilopochtli, he was more than a little disappointed to see a priest dancing wearing his daughter's skin. And as we all know how these people are about things, um, it's about the gap between their expectations and reality. And that gap was somewhat large here, so the Aztecs were chased away from the banks of Lakes uh, Chora Lakes Texacoco in a hail of arrows and they ended up at this lake, this island in the lake. However, they thrived from this position. They built a city of some 200,000 people, uh, maybe as many as 400,000, uh, on islands in the lake and population on the shores of the lake as well. Uh, they fed fresh water into the city with aqueducts. Around this time, London had a population of about 50,000, and the biggest city in, cities in um, the old world were Constantinople and Paris, both of which were about 200,000 people. So it was a big city, it was very orderly, roads weren't much use in the middle of a saline lake, so they got around in canoes. Um, they were a very clean people, they took steam baths and so forth. Uh, they were the early civilization to require compulsory universal education, although that was more from the point of view of training warriors and making everyone fit for war uh, rather than just a love of learning. 
Uh, they had good agricultural technology, so they worked out techniques for building what are called floating fields in the lake so that they could grow stuff um, in the... It's working now. They could, so here we've got their city, Tenochtitlan. This is where Mexico City is today. And this is Mexico. And uh, the, they went on. They, despite this agricultural technology, um, very good knowledge of astronomy, very good societal organization, very adept at prosecuting military campaigns, they didn't have wheels. They never got, they did invent wheels in the sense that they used them on a child's toy. So there was an archeological <laughs> find of a child's toy with little wheels, so like a little animal that could be pulled along. But they didn't scale this up to using for a cart or anything like that. Um, they also never invented writing. So writing apparently has only ever been invented three times in the world, but it tends to catch on because it's quite useful. So they documented things by using uh, pictures called codices. And they told stories in these uh, great big codices using these beautiful pictures. And they were sort of pre-Bronze Age when it came to technology with metal. So they didn't use metal weapons, for example. Uh, but they did have very sophisticated crafts. In particular, they were very good at feather work. And they went on to conquer the much of central Mexico. So we can see in these brown parts here, uh, the states that they've managed to, areas that they've conquered, the unit of, like, political unit in Mexico at the time, in Mesoamerica, was more the city-states rather than nations, rather than territory. So they were conquering tribes, and once they conquered a tribe, they would demand uh, tribute, and they would take taxes from the tribe, um, or... These were payable in luxury goods because also they didn't have the technology of money. So tribute was paid in luxury goods, things like feathers, bolts of cloth, avocados, luxury food. And uh, these were all sent to Tenochtitlan. And uh, they had a market in Tenochtitlan where these goods were sold. Uh, traders were considered very important to Aztec culture. And uh, this ongoing pattern of conquering was crucial to the Aztec way of life because their god, Huitzilopochtli, their patron god, so it was very much polytheistic society, hundreds of gods, and when they conquered a tribe, uh, the way they symbolized that in their codices was to show a broken temple. And the broken temple indicated that they'd got to the center of this tribe and uh, deposed their gods. But the, their attitude wasn't so much supplanting that tribe's gods with their own gods. Rather, it was they could then take those gods and add them to their own pantheon and get the power that was shown through those gods for themselves. Uh, so war was... So here we see very important to the Aztecs. We see here a picture of a, of a, a statue of an Aztec warrior. This is at a museum in Mexico City, where I visited several years ago. And this, you can see that he's dressed up in, uh, this armor is cotton. So they wore cotton armor, and they dressed up as eagles when they fought battles. So you can see that there's a strong ritual component to battle here. And uh, this weapon here is a wooden club edged with obsidian. And the, so they, their metal technology wasn't advanced enough to have metal blades. So instead, they used this volcanic rock, uh, which can be chipped to make a very sharp edge. And they would edge their wooden plug with obsidian. And according to Spanish accounts at the time, it could um, split open the front of a horse with a single blow. Uh, and you can see that there's elaborate feather work here. This is a reconstruction by an artist. And uh, this uh, feathered headdress and a, a shield. Uh, the soldiers typically fought in winter and summer, leaving spring and autumn to do agriculture, to grow the food. But the purpose of war, one of the key purposes of war, was to capture victims for sacrifice. So it wasn't so much about uh, scorched earth, kill everybody. It was more uh, grab sacrificial victims and take them back to Tenochtitlan to sacrifice for 
Huitzilopochtli and other gods. Quite right too. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so important was it to them to capture these victims for sacrifice uh, that it was, well, they, they started to run out of places to conquer, as you can see. So uh, you can see that there's this sort of um, sea of non-conquered tribe there, the Tlaxcala, and this uh, Montezuma, the emperor of the Aztecs, told the Cortes, the leader of the Spaniards, that the reason that they let the Tlaxcalas continue to exist um, without actually being conquered was that, that uh, they could have what was called wars of flowers with them. And the purpose of these wars were flowers, wars of flowers, was a war without hatred, where it was um, a ritual so that they could capture the, sacrifice, the sacrificial victims. So this is how important it was to them to uh, get human sacrifice victims. So here's another depiction of Aztec warfare, a contemporary a picture done in the uh, 16th century. And uh, you can see that we've got somebody fighting in a canoe and uh, him being attacked by somebody on land. I think my money's on the one that's not in a canoe. That would strike me as a particularly stable point for me, which is to, to fight from. And you can see they're wielding these obsidian clubs and they're holding shields and they've got the featherwork and the cotton armour. They're fighting barefoot, interestingly. So, um, this human sacrifice uh, was for this god, Huitzilopochtli. So, Huitzilopochtli means hummingbird on the left. <laughs> Which is, why left? Or sometimes um, given as left-handed hummingbird, which makes even less sense given that hummingbirds don't have hands. Um, the reason that he was called hummingbird on the left is the ass. This means hummingbird from the south, because in the same way that we view north as being up, the Aztecs uh, viewed south as being on the left. So everything like moved through 90 degrees. And so it's hummingbird from the south. Why hummingbird? They believed that the souls of warriors um, who had died in combat uh, came back as hummingbirds, and uh, blue hummingbirds at that. So you can see that he's uh, dressed up as a hummingbird with this uh, mask. And this is the turquoise serpent weapon. And this is uh, very important in relation to sacrifice. So this is a contemporary illustration of human sacrifice. So how do they go about doing human sacrifice? Well, the sacrificial victim, typically a captured warrior, uh, would climb up the steps to the temple. Uh, the main temple in the center of Tenochtitlan was called uh, Coatlpec, which means Serpent Mountain. Um, this relates to a myth that I'm going to tell shortly. And uh, he would go willingly because it was a great honor to be sacrificed. And then he would be stretched over a stone and uh, held by priests, and then the chief priest would take an obsidian dagger, cut open his chest, and then reach inside the cloven cavity of the thorax, and pull out the still, still beating heart, and offer it to the sun to ensure that the sun could continue its traversal across the sky. I did warn you that it was going to be a bit boring. I am, yeah. if anything, toning it down. Okay? So there is no doubt that this kind of human sacrifice occurred among the Aztecs. However, uh, the contemporary accounts from the Spaniards said that they were sacrificing 20,000 people a year and storing thousands of skulls in skull racks. These skull racks do exist, but the thousands of skulls have never been found in archaeological excavations. Archaeological excavations have only revealed fewer than about 700 bodies in the temple precinct that may have been sacrificial victims. Um, it's thought that maybe the Spaniards exaggerated the extent of human sacrifice in Aztec culture uh, to justify their brutal um, invasion and colonization of the society. Uh, we will never know, for sure. But a, I'm, not, I'm no archaeologi archaeologist or historian, but I did speak with a archaeologist who is a member of the club, and was told that typically archaeological evidence does trump contemporary accounts. So, here we have some obsidian daggers. So these are uh, these were found 
in the main temple, the remains of the main temple, you can see that they've got, like in a Japanese cartoon or something, uh, little eyes and teeth on them. Um, it's thought that these may actually be more um, ornamental sacrificial daggers rather than sort of practical use ones. Um, who knows? So, Sunday mess. Yeah. So this stone is crucial to the sacrificial ritual. It is the dismembered body of the sister of Huitzilopochtli. And it was a very important archaeological find, the second most archaeological find of the, um, in Aztec, relating to Aztec culture ever. It was found in the 1970s in the basement of the main cathedral in the center of Mexico City. They were doing some electrical work and they turned up this and uh, they knew that this was the goddess uh, difficult name to say, which means painted bells, which is a relatively nice name as Aztec god names go. And uh, sh this stone was located at the bottom of the temples um, where the sacrifice of Tzipotli took place. And this relates to a myth in Aztec um, mythology, whereby the mother of Huitzilopochtli, who was known as, uh, what's her name here? Uh, Coatlicu, which means serpent skirt, um, <laughs> another spooky name, but serpents represent fertility. She was sweeping a temple at the top of the mythical mountain Coatlpec, which means serpent mountain, and uh, Somehow some uh, feathers fell upon her, or another story is that she tucked them under her belt, and uh, she became with child. And for some reason, her daughter, whose name means painted, uh, painted bells, with, depicted here, was furious about this and rallied her brothers, sons of Serpent Skirt, from around, and they swarmed up the mountain and decapitated uh, their mother, Serpent Skirt. In retaliation to this, the god Huitzilopochtli leapt from his mother's womb, fully grown, an adult, and dismembered painted bells and threw her down the mountain. And so the human sacrifice atop the temple in the center of Mexico City, but Tenacli Park, um, was a reenactment, daily reenactment, of this mythological event with painted bells representing the moon and Huitzilopochtli representing the triumph of the sun over the moon. So there was none of this yin yang, make everything balanced and nice and cozy and mystic auras and things like that for, with the Aztecs. Their attitude was. The gods are out there to get us, we've got to sacrifice things to them, to get them to do what we need them to do, like stopping the sun going out. Every day is a battle between the sun and the moon, so that we don't get benighted. And so in finding this stone in the 1970s, the experts in Aztec culture knew that the Grand Temple of the Aztecs could not be far away. Uh, so, yeah, so here's a picture showing this story, so here we've got Serpent Skirt. Uh, once she was decapitated, apparently her head was uh, replaced with two serpent heads. And uh, as well as having a skirt made of snakes, she wore a necklace made of hands, hearts and skulls. That is the mother of the nation, the mother of God, so the equivalent of the Virgin Mary. And um, here we've got painted bells dismembered. And uh, here we've got Huitzilopochtli leaping from his uh, mother's womb to take on the, um, his brothers. It's pretty clear that this myth relates to some intertribal warfare that must have occurred among the Aztecs while they were um, in camp somewhere. Painted bells has two heads as well. Yeah, it looks like it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, 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 I think that's, that's the head there, and then that's one on oh, the other. Yeah, 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 clever clogs. <laughs> so, Here we have a model of the temple. So this temple was then found 
by the cathedral in the center of Mexico City. I was fortunate enough to visit it. You will notice that it's got multiple layers. And this was because uh, the Aztecs, to show how important the temple was to them, uh, say they would build another temple over it. So in, say, European culture, we sort of have really old churches and keep on extending them. In Japan, they like to knock down old shrines and then build a brand spanking new one to show how much they venerate the gods, hence the Grand Temple of Pisay, um, which um, the Aztecs would build a new shell over it and to expand the temple. And a wonderful thing about this from an archaeological point of view is that as they were building the new shell, they would chuck um, sacrifices in between the two layers. So when they were excavating this temple, they've got this like huge museum full of old stuff that tells us all sorts of things about the Aztecs. So it was an amazing archaeological find. Here on the top of the temple, we have two, uh, two temples. This one on the right is for Huitzilopochtli, the hummingbird, uh, god of war, of equal importance to the Aztecs was Tlaloc, who was the god of rain. Now, uh, you might like to think that the god of rain would be nicer than the god of war, but that is not to be. He um, is a very old god, uh, so the Aztecs inherited gods from previous Mesoamerican cultures, so the Aztecs weren't like the crowning achievement of Mesoamerica or anything, they just happened to be the culture that was in charge at the time of the invasion by the Spaniards. Um, Agriculture was very important to the Aztecs, and so was rain. And uh, the Aztecs believed that thunder was caused by pots breaking in the sky to allow water to pour out of it. And uh, the mode of sacrifice to Tlaloc, which is this fellow here, so Tlaloc is always is typically depicted as having goggle eyes and fangs, because that's what your nice neighbourly rain god should look like. Of course, goggle eyed and fanged. Um, they would sacrifice children to Talalok, so child sacrifice. And um, it, when um, a child, children were being led to be sacrificed, um, sometimes by drowning, um, if they cried, then that was considered good news because the tears symbolized uh, the rain falling. So, let's move on to the next god. Can anyone make a modest proposal? <laughs> Sorry. Um, the... This is Tezcatli Poker. As drawn by Matt Groening. Uh, this is an Aztec codex. This is from one of the Aztec codices. So this is an original Aztec uh, drawing of Tezcatli Poker. Key features of Tezcatli Poker. So his name means smoking mirror, and this relates to his relationship with night, obsidian, sorcery, divination, dark things like the things we've been talking about haven't already been rather dark. But no, this is the god of darkness. Uh, one of the key features of him is this black stripe around his face, and another one is his funny-looking foot, which, uh, where his foot is replaced by an obsidian mirror. So they would also use obsidian for mirrors, and this was used as, um, as a means of divination. So, how did they sacrifice the test Catholic Poker? So the way they sacrificed the Tezcatli poker is that they would choose a particularly fine example of a captive warrior and they would treat him as a god for one year. And people would worship him as though they were worshipping Tezcatli poker himself. And uh, the, Aztec, the Aztecs had two calendars. One was the calendar that related to actual days and that lasted uh, 365 days. And then they had another calendar, which was the ritual calendar, which consisted of 13 months of 20 days each. And for the last 20 days, the last ritual month of this year of being a uh, worshipped as a god, he would spend with four um, beautiful maidens who had been treated as goddesses for a year. And um, he was married to them, all four of them, and their connubial activities symbolized a period of fertility um, at the end um, of a period of drought. And uh, then they would, of course, cut him open and rip his heart out, as, as usual, and uh, they would pick the next ripped captive warrior to do the next year of being worshipped as a god. 
Right, so, who's this chap? This is the god of spring. The time of little fluffy bunnies and chicks and Easter eggs and things like that. <laughs> but not for the Aztecs. <laughs> so this is Shipe Totec. <laughs> right, why does he look a bit funny? What's this thing over his head? That is a flayed human skin. You know that's a symbol of spring? Yes. <laughs> So, top tip, don't put that on your Easter cart. <laughs> um, so, the, the, skin, the flayed, flayed skin to the Aztecs represented the husk of new, newly growing wheat. Um, and uh, the way the skin is sloughed off from snakes and uh, things like that. And his name means Our Lord the Flayed One. And the, the uh, lost skin represented renewal. And the way they did sacrifice for this fellow yes. um, was they would uh, take a sacrificial victim, lash him to a wooden frame, and then fire arrows at him um, until, uh, and the blood dripping down the sacrificial victim represented the rain falling in spring. And then when he had met his inevitable demise, um, they flayed him, and then a priest would wear his skin for 20 days. So, uh, so it's a dirty job that someone's got to do it, wearing these uh, flayed skins. They're quite good at curing these flayed skins. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think we... Don't think we know, actually. Otherwise it's going to get a bit smelly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, now, we can take a look at the nice god. <laughs> This is Quetzalcoatl, um, this is, whose name means feathered serpent. You might have heard of Quetzal feathers, uh, brightly coloured uh, feathers from Central America, so that's where the word comes from. Quetzal is a Nahuatl word. Nahuatl was the language of the Aztecs. And uh, yeah, the eating somebody thing there is a bit incidental. The main thing is that it's a serpent who has feathers. And this was the god of life, wisdom and light. So a relatively nice god, and uh, to the extent that he wasn't so keen on sacrifice, um, and uh, so he uh, did. Yeah, you know, people typically sacrifice things like butterflies and rabbits to Quetzalcoatl. Some even suspect that he objected to human sacrifice altogether, but he probably actually would think that that was taking this sort of woke warrior thing too far, it was like political correctness gone mad. He just sort of wanted to, to tone it down a bit on the human sacrifice front. And um, as a result, he was uh, expelled from um, Mesoamerica uh, by the other gods. And uh, it is thought, uh, that there's also another story that he was expelled from Mesoamerica for uh, sharing chocolate with humans. <laughs> Small price to pay, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, and there is a wonderful story, which is largely debunked, but worth telling because it's such a good story, that uh, there was an Aztec legend that Quetzalcoatl had been banished to the east, which was down to them, and when the, he was also supposed to be light-skinned, and uh, there was a prophecy that he would return in a year that went by the label one read. Uh, and that corresponded to the day that the calendar year commenced on the ritual calendar. So they had, they were named after a number and an object. And a year would be named after the day in the ritual calendar that he arrived. In 1519, the year that the Spaniards arrived, happened to be a one read year, which is when Quetzalcoatl was supposed to, was prophesied to return. And he was supposed to be light skinned. So there was some, there was some talk at the time that the Aztecs thought that Cortes and the Spaniards returning uh, was the return of their god Quetzalcoatl. Um, however, the Spaniards probably pawned to high heaven, wearing as, they, wearing as they were boots and doubloons and stuff in tropical heat, uh, probably not like an Aztec god at all, and it seems a bit it was more of a vanity thing by the Spaniards rather than anything that's been recorded in um, Aztec uh, documents. But it's a really good story. So why did I, out of all the Aztec pantheon of 400 gods uh, talk about primarily these four gods. Huitzilopochtli, Tezcatlipoca, Xipe Totec, and Quetzalcoatl. 
These were known as the four Tezcatli pokers. Goodness knows why it's not the four priests of the populace, because they were the patron gods. But no, in the, uh, in the Aztec pantheon, these were considered to be the creator gods, the gods who created the world. I think their creation myth was more complex than that, but I never really managed to get my head around it. And so they're sort of four aspects of the same thing, and they each have a colour associated with them. So Fritz in the Pockling was associated with blue, the hummingbirds. Tezcatlipoca was the god of darkness, so he was symbolised by white, by black. Shipe Totec was associated with red, perhaps because people after they've been flayed go red. Uh, <laughs> and Quetzalcoatl, because he was relatively nice, was associated with white. And then they were each associated with a, uh, one of the cardinal points of the compass. So Vixilopochtli being south, as we've talked about, Tezcatlipoca with the north, Shipe Totec east, Quetzalcoatl the west, so the opposite direction to which he was banished in. And uh, Aztec religious symbolism is got a great deal of this kind of uh, technical, this symbolizes that, this is associated with that, um, these things going on, it would, uh, just like a tiny aspect of it, could occupy um, a 40 minute talk, so I'm not going to sweat that. So, looking back at this, um, this, oh yeah, one other thing to mention on the whole sacrifice thing, although the Aztecs did a lot of sacrificing of things, of other things, um, a really important thing to them was self-sacrifice. So they did a lot of self, self, um, like cutting and piercing their ear lobes and their um, their uh, noses with thorns. And um, when children went to school, they were cut and um, had thorns dragged over them and things like this uh, to like say to do sort of sacrifices themselves because they're so grateful to the gods. It's so important to keep the gods happy and uh, repay for them for the sacrifices that they made to create the earth. So the conquest of the Aztecs. So um, Cortes and about 500 Spanish, so there was a Spanish leader, they'd come over from, I think it was Cuba, they came over to the, what is now the Mexican coast, the Yucatan Peninsula, and uh, they heard about this great empire in Tenochtitlan, and uh, the sort of story is that Cortes and 500 soldiers managed to, to uh, invade the Aztec Empire and uh, defeat them single-handedly. What actually happened was that uh, Cortes was uh, very adept at uh, fermenting civil war, so he went around various tribes, he found a couple of shipwrecked Spaniards, one had gone native and fought against the Spaniards in their war of colonization, but another one um, had learnt a Mayan language, and then with the help of a local woman called, who they called Donna Marina, uh, who spoke Mayan and Nahuatl, the Aztec language of the Aztecs, he was able to go around uh, various tribes who resented paying tribute to the Aztecs and uh, drum up support for a civil war. And uh, they went and invaded Tenochtitlan, which of course was vulnerable, needing to have fresh water piped in, and was subject to siege by being in the middle of a lake and being reliant on a lot of imported food. Uh, but, and uh, the Spaniards, it's a complicated story, but the Spaniards uh, allied with the Tlaxcalans as well. So this enclave that they had left uh, to fight ritual battles with, uh, Cortes was able to form an alliance with them, and they were then able to take out, that they were then able to defeat the Aztecs. Perhaps the main influence, though, in defeating the Aztecs was smallpox. So they, the Mesoamericans had no defense against smallpox whatsoever, and once it was introduced, about 40% of them uh, died of smallpox uh, within about a year. Absolute uh, tragic. And the Spanish, unlike the Aztecs, were not interested in taking on other gods, but in supplanting the local Aztec gods uh, with their own mono theism. So there is this stone in the center of Mexico City um, at uh, an important archaeological site that says that it was uh, here that the Spaniards, it's houses, it's Cortes defeated the Aztecs and it says it was neither a triumph nor a defeat, it was the painful birth of the Mestizo people that is the Mexico of today. 
because the Mexicans are not just like Spanish colonials. They are the, uh, the blend of Spanish culture and uh, Aztec culture, Mesoamerican culture. And when I, I had the good fortune to visit Mexico City, and it was quite clear there that uh, some, there was strong Spanish influences, but equally strong Aztec influences. And this shows through in things like Aztec art. Uh, there's also a few words that we've taken from the Nahuatl language. For example, uh, coyote is a Nahuatl word. Tomato is from tomatl, which is a Nahuatl word. But crucially, chocolate comes from the Aztec chocolatl. Uh, it was not invent chocolate wasn't invented by the Aztecs. Uh, it was invented by the Mayans like a thousand years ago. Uh, but it was uh, the word that we use for it derives from an Aztec word. So that is everything I had to say. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Do we have any questions, Bobby? Yep, yep. Dispute over the authority on the skulls. In that if you leave large mammal bones in the UK lying around a couple of years, depending on Cindy, the but there's gone. Furthermore, uh, Caramojo Bell won't be the, the leading ivory hunter of the turn of the century in British South Africa. So that whenever he returned to places where he'd, he'd made successful kills, only the large bones remain. And then several years after that, there'd be nothing. Uh -huh. So the fact that you can't find anything doesn't mean that they're not there. Uh -huh. It just means that you can't find anything. What's the club policy on human sacrifice? You volunteering? Yes, I am actually. <laughs> I might nominate. I to one of these schools. Yes, sir. So, so part of this bit, can I sort of the had a year of being treated like a god and then they're sacrificed? Were they aware they were going to be sacrificed? Oh yes. You know, did they yes. saw it as a sort yeah. of a, they saw it as a great you seen well it was supposed to be seen as a great honour. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, open to debate whether every single one did view it as a great honour. But yes, I prefer Woody Allen from, from, from yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They were drawn from uh, from from conquerors. Yeah. But defeated warriors so yeah. It wasn't their own people rooted deeply within that belief system volunteering for yeah. it was... Although the other tribes had similar belief systems. Right. The gods were just Aztec gods, the gods were the Mesoamerican gods, and uh, like different, different tribes chose different patron gods and would gladly adopt gods from other tribes. Uh, Sarah? Um, I was watching Snakes play a part in the intro to the they probably did have a snake god, although I don't specifically know of one. They do have uh, gods of all sorts of things. Uh, one of the most intriguing things I saw in the uh, museum next to the big temple was a, uh, a snake mat. It was carved from stone and it was snakes interwoven with each other to look like a mat. Quite a thing to see. Uh, I was interested by the, was it east is down, is that correct? Or uh, east is up? No, down. East is down, so the south is on the left. Okay, because, yeah. you know, coming from the southern hemisphere, you know, <laughs> I believe that south is up. And many, many of us do believe that. Uh, uh -huh. So, you know, the maps are all drawn wrongly. Uh -huh. But, uh, yeah, so I was intrigued by that aspect of yeah. uh, Aztec culture. Yeah, so, um, the, yeah, that Aztec... So yeah, you've got the antipedal thing of um, turning the map upside down. The Aztecs show how arbitrary that the sort of European way of viewing the world is. Well, to a Martian, you know, the, the globe is whatever, you know. Yeah, it's, it, it's indeed. Position, but, you know, um, does that come from, like, a long tradition of Mexican culture or white culture? Or I don't know, presumably. Yeah. They probably didn't dream it up themselves. They seem to be more interested in dreaming up ways of waging war. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Um, can I ask about the Aztec language? I was really yep. impressed by your pronunciation yes. of the Aztec gods. Um, how do we know how they pronounce the words? Well, well people still speak Nahuatl. So I even have a colleague who speaks Nahuatl. So yeah, well, it's, 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 yeah. Yeah. it's not just it's not so a dead language like Latin. Uh, yeah. People still still speak the. I think it's still like a a a, a, a living language. Probably changed. Consider like Welsh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, the yeah. Spanish had, when all the priests were quite little bit, and, and they recorded, I mean, most of what we know about the Aztecs, besides archaeology, is 
they, they reported actually quite a lot of detail. Yeah, so they got uh, Jesuit monks to, yeah. so there was a mission to go over and record the Aztec way of life before a they died. The yeah, so they did lots of drawings and then they wrote annotations I mean, Spanish, because the Aztecs thought, oh, writing, that's a good idea. <laughs> and so they got scribes uh, writing about everyday life in the Aztec world. One more question? Um, Spanish oh, men, this is more a professional ignorance than a question. <laughs> and the Spanish men, which I used to think was the Spanish main sea lake, in fact, Spanish main, the Spanish mainland. And the port the ship was built from, except on the Yucatan Peninsula, I can't remember its name, it's very important, it's non existent now. Uh, and the span the the uh, sea lanes went to the north of Jamaica over where uh, uh, Fleming and all the rest of had thousands of, uh, and, and that was where the pirates lay in wait because of the galleons left from that fort and yet that's the incident uh -huh. from the Spanish main. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thing. Uh, just to say thank you again, Tim. Play your hand. Very good. Thanks to all of you watching at home. That worked for you. See you soon. Yes.